A few months ago, it was announced that the longest-running Broadway show of all time, Phantom of the Opera, would be closing on Broadway after a little over 35 years. This is kind of a big deal. This show is an institution. It's one of the most watched and performed stage shows of all time. It was at one time the most successful piece of entertainment in history, making over six billion dollars throughout its various productions around the world. I didn't think it closing on Broadway was legal. It's not a perfect show by any means, but the classic story and the incredible score by Andrew Lloyd Webber more than make up for any shortcomings the show has, in my opinion. However, this show, like most of my favorite pieces of media, fascinates me just as much, if not more, through its meta-contextual story than by the piece itself. And while there are a million interesting stories surrounding Phantom of the Opera, perhaps the most interesting is how it relates to the life of composer Andrew Lloyd Webber. I call this story the semi-autobiographical nature of sexy ugly man Eric, the Phantom of the Opera. Development on ALW's version of Phantom of the Opera began in 1984, but before I get to that, I want to touch on two things. Phantom of the Opera before the musical it inspired, and Andrew Lloyd Webber before he was inspired to write Phantom of the Opera. The Phantom of the Opera was originally written by French journalist turned novelist Gaston Leroux in 1909, where it was originally published as a serialized novel before being published collectively in 1910. If you don't know what a serialized novel is, think of it kind of like TV at the time, with the book coming out chapter by chapter rather than all at once, usually being published in an ongoing magazine. If you read the original book, you might notice most of the chapters happen to end on a cliffhanger, and the reason for this is because you have to keep the readers coming back for more. This isn't the only issue you may have with reading the novel though, it's frankly not very well written and is very tedious in places. Like several now classic gothic horror novels, much of the book is spent setting up this great mystery, as well as various red herrings as to what could be causing that mystery. However, since the twist, in this case that the Phantom is a disfigured man living underneath the opera, has become so iconic that it's a given with adaptations of the story, the source material feels like it's beating around the bush. It feels odd for them to be suggesting it's a real ghost, or that it's this character, or that character, when most of us know what's actually going on. Most later movie and TV adaptations of the story therefore choose not to include this mystery element and go for straight horror, depicting a crazy disfigured man lurking in the bowels of an opera house, killing and kidnapping in the name of obsession and revenge. So that's how Phantom of the Opera was viewed before the musical. Now let's take a look at Andrew Lloyd Webber and what his career was like leading up to Phantom. Phantom was no breakout hit for Lloyd Webber, who had already had several successful shows under his belt, including two of the most well-known musicals of all time. For the 60s and 70s, Lloyd Webber's main lyricist and collaborator was Tim Rice, and the two produced several hit shows during this time, including Jesus Christ Superstar, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, and Evita. The only show during this time that didn't involve Rice's collaboration was Jeeves, an ultimately unsuccessful show Rice chose not to work on for fear of not living up to its source material. Their relationship would ultimately fall apart in the late 70s as they were working on the one-act musical Tell Me on a Sunday. After Elaine Page became a breakout star for her leading role in Evita, she and the then-married Tim Rice began to have an affair. Upon discovering Rice was writing the lead in Tell Me on a Sunday with Page in mind, Weber felt he couldn't continue the project with Rice without feeling he was supporting Rice's infidelity. Don Black would instead write the lyrics and Andrew Lloyd Webber was now without a consistent collaborator. The fact that Webber broke it off with his long-running collaborator because he didn't support his infidelity will become very important in just a few minutes. Without Rice, Webber decided he would write a new show based on a book of poems he had loved as a kid by T.S. Eliot. After all, if the show was sung through like most of his shows were, and he just wrote music and lifted the poems as the lyrics, he wouldn't need a lyricist to collaborate with. And that is how Cats was born. Cats was Andrew Lloyd Webber's most popular show to date, being at one point both the longest running musical on Broadway and the West End, running for 21 years on the West End and almost 18 years on Broadway. 
Lloyd Webber's next show would be Starlight Express, a show about trains that he wrote with Richard Stilgo, a lyricist he first worked with to supply additional lyrics to some songs in Cats that were based off of unfinished and unreleased T.S. Eliot poems. And after writing two shows that were very lighthearted and fun, he wanted to write something more serious. He wanted to write a love story. Why? Well, it just so happened Andrew Lloyd Webber was going through a love story of his own. Andrew Lloyd Webber describes himself as a bit of a hopeless romantic. When he met his first wife, Sarah Hugo, he was 21 and she was 16. Yeah. Anyways, once she turned 18 in 1971, the two got married. And their marriage was said to be pretty steady, a rock that ALW's peers in the entertainment industry could count on. But all that changed in late 1982 when he went to see the premiere production of Charles Strauss's musical Nightingale, starring Sarah Brightman as the lead. Weber had known Brightman, or at least known of her, for two years at this point. After all, the actress, who started out as a part of the dance troupe Hot Gossip, played the minor role of Jemima in the original London cast of Cats. However, he never noticed her until Nightingale when he was struck by what he saw as an incredibly talented singer. This led to the two of them becoming very close, and according to Andrew Lloyd Webber, by March of 1983, he had fallen in love with her. In April, he announced to his wife, Sarah One, and soon to their two children, his intention to end their marriage to pursue a relationship with Sarah Brightman. Talk about drama. Brightman herself was also married to Andrew Graham Stewart, and had been since 1979, and this wouldn't be her first affair. In fact, she had already cheated on her husband with Mike Moran, a keyboard player in the Cat's Pit, a couple years prior. Most of 1983 was spent with the two of them being semi-openly together as their respective marriages were winding down. A particularly mind-blowing highlight of this is when the two of them went on the Merv Griffin show and performed a song he wrote for her called Young Enough to Fall in Love Again, also known as Married Man. In this song, Sarah Brightman is a woman who acts as a mistress to a married man. This is real. I couldn't make this up if I tried because it would sound unrealistic. Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote a song for his mistress to sing while he was still married about a mistress to a married man. And they performed it on a nationally syndicated talk show with Merv Griffin practically winking at Andrew Lloyd Webber, who is clearly regretting the decision last minute. This man, who years prior broke up with his longtime writing partner because of his infidelity, was now broadcasting his infidelity on national television as promotion for the Broadway production of Cats. It was worth it though, because without that we wouldn't have had the Modern Cinema Experience released in December of 2019 that, in my personal and non-medical based opinion, is single-handedly responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. In January of 1984, our A and B stories would collide when Andrew Lloyd Webber would hear from Sarah Brightman that she had been offered the role of Christine in a musical version of Phantom of the Opera written by a man named Ken Hill, which would premiere later that year in Newcastle before eventually transferring to London. While she would turn it down, Lloyd Webber and his producer friend Cameron McIntosh would express interest in possibly producing the show and decided to keep tabs on the production. In May, not long after Andrew Lloyd Webber divorced Sarah Hugill and married Sarah Brightman, and Sarah Brightman divorced Andrew Graham Stewart and married Andrew Lloyd Webber, goddammit that's hard to say, the two of them and Cameron McIntosh went to see the London production of Phantom of the Opera. And they thought that the show had room to grow, but was a solid foundation and could act as a good vehicle for Brightman. This version of Phantom of the Opera had first premiered in 1976, a year after the release of the movie The Rocky Horror Picture Show, based on the stage musical The Rocky Horror Show. And it was very much taking cues from that show, being a camp comedy based on Phantom of the Opera rather than a dramatic interpretation. While it wouldn't be incredibly successful in its 1984 run, Lloyd Webber and Macintosh announced they would be involved in producing the show after its initial production. While the original 1976 production had an original rock score by Ian Armit, the new version premiering in 1984 only featured music from classical operas, some of the score including new lyrics by Hill over the opera music. The plan was to punch up the show a little while keeping its initial integrity. While the score would remain virtually unchanged, it was decided that Lloyd Webber would write a marketable pop title song for the show, and he and Mike Batt wrote a song with Lloyd Webber's usual pop rock sensibilities, but centered around an organ playing a chromatic scale. And that 
is when things started to fall apart. Weber and Macintosh's choice for director was Jim Sharman, who had previously directed the West End production of Jesus Christ Superstar. However, despite already having a relationship with Andrew Lloyd Webber, the reason for his consideration was because he was the original director of the Rocky Horror Show as well as its movie adaptation. While having lunch with Weber and Macintosh in Tokyo in the fall of 1984, however, Sharman would turn down the opportunity, no longer wishing to direct out their comedies, focusing instead on dramatic operas. And this would ultimately lead to Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron Macintosh pulling the plug on producing Phantom of the Opera, as they couldn't see a way forward with the project without Sharman's direction. However, near the end of their meeting, Sharman would lean into Webber and suggest that he himself should write Phantom rather than producing a different adaptation. He would promptly ignore this suggestion, and Phantom of the Opera, as well as the title song he had written for it, was dead in the water. That is, until 1985. At this point, Weber was in New York City, overseeing rehearsals for the premiere of Requiem, a classical piece written in memory of his father who had passed a couple of years prior. While in New York, he happened to find himself in a used bookshop, and by pure coincidence there was a copy of the English translation of the original Phantom of the Opera novel. While he and Macintosh had watched the 1925 silent horror film starring Lon Chaney in preparation to produce Ken Hill's musical, he had never read the source material itself and when he finally did, he discovered a new angle on the work that he hadn't previously seen. It wasn't a comedy, but it also wasn't a mystery or a horror story. To Andrew Lloyd Webber, he had finally found his love story. He didn't see the Phantom as strictly a villain. Webber saw him as a tragic character that had been shunned by society and was a victim of unrequited love. And inspired by this new outlook on the story, as well as the opportunity to write the leading role of Christine for his wife, he decided to take Charmin's advice and write Phantom of the Opera himself. But why did I spend like 15 minutes explaining to you the origin of this show? Well, I think it's important that you understand the context of the work before I talk about its contents. As a refresher for those familiar with the show and an introduction for those who aren't, here's a brief summary of the plot. Rehearsals are ongoing for the Paris Opera House's new production of Hannibal, when their prima donna Carlotta quits due to supposed hauntings going on at the venue. The new managers are worried about what they're going to do with there being a show that night. Madame Giry, the choreographer, suggests chorus girl Christine Daae as a temporary replacement, saying that she is being taught by a very good teacher. After impressing the managers, Christine blows away that night's audience, including her childhood sweetheart and Viscount Raoul de Chagny. We learn this mysterious teacher of Christine's is also the legendary phantom that haunts the opera house, but Christine, being a religious girl, believes he is actually an angel of music sent by her late father to guide her. That night, the Phantom takes Christine down into his lair and reveals to the audience that he is not a ghost or angel at all, but some guy who lives in a cave underneath the opera house. He's a musical virtuoso that also wears a half domino mask and also sometimes wears a dramatic hat and glittery cape. And he's clearly in love with Christine. And he's bipolar, racing through several emotions from angry to sad to calm when confronted by Christine's curiosity of what's beneath his mask. Soon enough, the Phantom demands the opera management make Christine the permanent star, otherwise he'll rain hellfire among the employees of the opera. The cat and mouse develops over the meat of the show, with the managers refusing to have anyone but Carlotta lead the shows, and the Phantom continuously threatening the lives and well-being of others. In this whole time, Christine is having a personal crisis, being in love with Raoul while also feeling scared and manipulated by the Phantom, who has created a toxic relationship between the two through her daddy issues, with her still believing that the Phantom may be linked to her father in some way. When Christine agrees to marry Raoul, the Phantom drops the Opera House chandelier out of pure rage, and not long after, he announces an ultimatum to the staff. He reveals he has written his own opera, called Don Juan Triumphant, and demands that it be performed at the opera with Christine in the starring role of Aminta, otherwise a broken chandelier will be the least of their problems. After more emotional turmoil, Raoul and the opera managers believe the Phantom will make some kind of appearance during the premiere performance of Don Juan Triumphant, and ready the police to arrest him in the event. Sure enough, the Phantom disposes of lead tenor Piangi during the show and replaces him during the duet between Don Juan and Aminta. 
Christine unmasks him in front of the opera audience, revealing the hideous deformity beneath his mask, and as the opera house descends into chaos, the Phantom kidnaps Christine once again to bring her to his lair. Raoul follows to save Christine from being whisked away into a loveless marriage with the Phantom, and ultimately Christine herself saves the day. After she and the Phantom kiss, he feels kindness for the first time, and can see the error of his ways, letting her and Raoul go free before disappearing into the night, his fate left uncertain. There's a specific way that the Phantom is portrayed in this show that I believe is really the reason why it took off. The Phantom is first introduced as a mysterious figure vying for Christine's affection, and for most of the show, he is the villain, and he is obsessed with Christine to the point of threats and murder. But right near the end, right as his face is revealed, there's a sympathetic turn for the character that you might not expect. I remember watching Phantom of the Opera for the first time, and wondering why people even rooted for the Phantom when he's so clearly the villain throughout the entire show. I remember watching Phantom for the first time and just being so confused, wondering why people root for the Phantom when he's so clearly in the wrong. But in the last 10 minutes or so, as the Phantom has essentially a breakdown, losing what little he has left, the audience really gets on his side. It's done so that it really hits that this is someone who has suffered all of his life, has been outcast by society, and been forced to hide away. When this show hit the theater and was a smash hit, it didn't matter if some stuffy critics thought Sarah Brightman wasn't as good as Andrew Lloyd Webber thought she was. People connected with the Phantom as a character, and they believed in a relationship between the Phantom and Christine. Through this empathetic approach, the Phantom is a very relatable character. All the Phantom has is his humble cave home and the theater, and now that that's being threatened, it's all it takes for him to snap. And sure, some of the things he did are inexcusable, but he couldn't help himself. He fell in love with Christine. He's a hopeless romantic. Wait a minute. Hopeless romantic, right, that's what this video is about. So this whole time I've been talking about a story about a brilliant but tortured composer who, yeah sure, maybe he's not the best looking, but he has a heart. And then he falls in love with this young ingenue performer, and some people think she's not the most talented, but he thinks she is, and takes her under his wing and writes this amazing show for her to star in. And sure, not everything he did was the most ethical, because it kind of went against his morals at the beginning, but he did what he did out of true love. But a true love that ultimately wasn't meant to be. But I haven't been talking about the story of the Phantom and Christine. I've been talking about the story of Andrew Lloyd Webber and Sarah Brightman, a forbidden love that would ultimately end in tragedy just a few years after the smash success of Phantom of the Opera. Webber was attracted to the story for a reason, and it's probably the same reason that what everyone else saw as a horror story, he saw as a love story. Because it was his love story. He saw himself as the Phantom and Brightman as Christine. You remember that song Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote for Sarah Brightman? Well, during writing for Phantom of the Opera, it was decided that the Phantom needed a solo song during Act 1 to help get the audience on his side. And he chose to take the music for Young Enough to Fall in Love Again, a song written to represent his relationship with Brightman, and use it as the instrumental for a song representing the Phantom and Christine's relationship. That's how the most iconic song in the entire show, Music of the Night, came to be. The song that made the Phantom into a heartthrob among teenage girls and their moms alike was the one where he dropped this mysterious glittery persona and tried to convey to Christine how he was feeling. And that's exactly what Andrew Lloyd Webber was trying to do when he wrote this show. Phantom of the Opera is an anomaly to me. It's this romantic interpretation of a horror mystery novel written based on a relationship that no longer exists. And somehow, the combination of those two things led to a piece of art that will last forever and will outlast both of its pieces of source material. Even if it's no longer going to be lasting forever on Broadway, Phantom of the Opera will continue all around the world. I mean, it's already been around nearly 40 years, and people are still going to see it. And I think that's the main thing to take away. Even though the relationship between Andrew Lloyd Webber and Sarah Brightman lasted less than a decade, the emotions that the two of them shared and were put into this show, they were real. 
and they've outlasted that relationship and will likely outlast every single person who was a part of Phantom of the Opera when it began. Even if the Phantom of the Opera can be a little over the top at times, and the characterization can be a little off, it's still hard for me not to classify it as art. Because it is an immortalization of real love and real emotions that lives on decades after the original is gone and continues to affect people. And that's what art is. An immortalization of life and emotion. A time capsule whether it's 1886, 1986, or 2086. Thanks for watching, and thanks for feeling.